subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this most interesting manthan after the Diwali break. As you know, the only reason manthan exists is to bring you great conversations week after week. It is our attempt. Ladies and gentlemen, and it uh, is. It is our attempt to get you. It is our attempt to get you the finest thinkers, writers, and achievers from across the world to talk to us. In that journey, we are thrilled to have with us two of the finest Indians to talk on our national religion, cricket. We all know Ramachandra Guha, who has been to Manthan twice before. Ram is one of the finest historians we have. He wrote two biographies of Mahatma Gandhi. First, the Gandhi Gandhi before India, and then Gandhi the years that changed India. These are seminal works by all standards. He has written extensively on a variety of issues, including politics, environment, history, cricket, and more. No wonder he is regarded as the finest historian we have today. What is even more important is that is that in the time we live in, is his willingness to speak truth to power. He always keeps the conscience of the nation. and we are immensely grateful to him for that while he is a great historian uh, he is a huge cricket lover and has written several first rate books on cricket and his recent book is commonwealth of cricket this book this is an extraordinary book on cricket and we are thrilled to have him talk to us about this book he says he writes on history for a living and on cricket to live i have read most of this book and recommend it to you all please pick up a copy and i guarantee you won't put it down till you finish while it is great to have ram at manthan it's an icing on the cake to have nasiruddin shah engage with him in conversation on the book nasir sahab is without doubt the finest actor in india india has ever had no words can describe his greatness and what he has contributed to the uh, to the country He has been an avid cricket lover and is best equipped to engage with Ram today. While well, we are thrilled to have both of them at Manthan, this event deserved to be under the big tree at Vidyaranya School. Sadly, it was not to be. But we assure you that we'll get them both of them when the pandemic makes it possible. Thank you and uh, thank you both Ram and uh, uh, Nasir Sahab for coming here. Uh, all yours. Uh, Please uh, take over from now. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you very much for all the kind things you said. The the name Manthan for me has a special connection because the second film I ever did was titled Manthan, and it was the one which generated work for me in the film industry. So I guess I have a special connection. Anyway, <clears throat> so welcome to all the viewers to this morning of cricket conversation. I am sure you will agree, Ram, that the a few better ways to spend a sunday morning than to talk cricket unless of course you're out on the field glorying in uh, uh, what you call the most subtle and sophisticated game known to mankind or witnessing a match somewhere and uh, and and uh, uh, seeing one of the most wonderful man made sights in the world which is a bunch of white flannelled youngsters cavorting on a, a verdant cricket field there are few more sights in the world which are more pleasing to the eye and the sound the musical listening for this musical sound of the of the ball hitting the the sweet spot of the bat there is absolutely no argument uh, with your definition of the game or your love affair with this subtle and a sophisticated game known to mankind ram but it's also a strange paradox that uh, though cricket is 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 for those who played it it leaves indelible memories both of your own achievements and and of others but it's also a game which people seem to love to hate i haven't heard anybody state that they hate football or they hate tennis or they hate motor racing with as much passion as as they hate cricket um this is something that uh, that has puzzled me and i and i have often wondered what it is 
What do you think it is, Ram, about this game which arouses such strong passions, both for and against? Is it because uh, uh, the focus of the cricket lover on the game is so strong? In fact, my wife used to often ask me, what is, what is there that you find so interesting about every single delivery from morning till evening? And I could not explain to her, of course. But is it that, the, that marriage partners begin to feel cricket is a rival? Or do you think there's something more, uh, it sets off some more primal uh, emotion in all of us? Well, uh, it's interesting. You know, I think, you know, like you, um, uh, I'm married to someone who's a hugely successful professional. And like you, probably, she doesn't see cricket as a rival. She sees it uh, as a, a, a bizarre indulgence that her husband or partner mm -hmm you know, has, and he can be left to that while I do my own things. But it is, you're right that it does, ex you know, so I don't know about Ratna, but, but my wife Sujata does not hate cricket. She's magisterially indifferent to the game. She also disregards it so much that she has no emotions about it at all. All right. Now, but there are some Indians who hate cricket. Economists, for example, who calculate the impact on our GDP when India is playing Pakistan and 500 million people are not at work, but glued to the television sets. Or old-fashioned xenophobes, the long-serving Sarsan Chalak of the RSS, MS Golwankar detested cricket and wanted cricket to quit India with the British. Uh, Ram Manohar Loya was supposed to hate cricket, cricket, so secretly he followed what Hadi Mohammed's score was in the Bombay Test of 1960. Uh, some of our aesthetes are puzzled by lovers of other sports. I think the people who have the best case to uh, dislike cricket, Nasir, are those who rightly say that too much public attention, emotion, passion, finances and infrastructure in India goes to that game in contrast to you know, other games at which we've excelled. I mean, how many people know, for example, watching this program, that not far from where Nasir Din Shah lives in Mumbai, in Bandra, uh, the great Michael Pereira lives, or before him, Wilson Jones. Even if they know Michael Pereira's name, they'll surely forgotten Wilson Jones, who was right. world billiards champion in the 1950s. Yes, so I'd Whereas say, everybody knows where Sachin Tendulkar lives. Exactly, right exactly, exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolute. Or even Prithvi Shaw lives. They even know where Prithvi Shaw lives. Yeah. Right. So that's it. I'd say among those who detest and dislike cricket, the ones who have the best case are uh, those who follow, promote, and play other sports. But then it is, I mean, no. When I, uh, my subtitle, Nasim, a lifelong love affair that is just purely accurate, that's factual and descriptive, with the most subtle and sophisticated game known to humankind. Now, this is probably, as they would say in Hindi, ko chabi dena do football, do football or basketball ke shauki na, unko chabi dena right? But I do believe it, I do believe it. And you know, your, 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 your description uh, of uh, starting this conversation of a verdant field with people in whites, and every delivery is different. You know, every delivery, every move, every stroke, and always in whites. So it is for the A seat. There is a you know, there's a joy in watching and studying and observing cricket and sometimes playing cricket and failing at playing the cover drive that Kavaska played so well, or failing in bowling the outswing outswinger that Kapil Dev had perfected so sublimely. There's also a beautiful aesthetics to the game. And in that sense, you know, that's why I think it's superior to any other sport. Right. So, I think this book is about uh, as close as you're ever going to come to writing a book of memoirs, Ram. And uh, I really appreciate that you've given us a glimpse into uh, uh, an aspect of you that many people didn't know. Uh, you as a player. Uh, and there are several wonderful passages in the book. Of course, I read it uh, in one go. I couldn't stop. But, but there's a passage I'd like to read out. Uh, which has a special resonance for me. And this is about your days at St. Stephen's College. There were three classes of cricketers at St. Stephen's. In the third or bottom class were boys who had played for their school team but would never be good enough to make the college first eleven. Yet they lived in hope, coming for practice every day, bowling a bit, batting even less. Most of their time spent collecting balls from the back and side of the nets or from the outfield. Occasionally, they got to play a friendly match against a local club, batting at eight or nine, and perhaps bowling the odd over. 
It normally took a full year of practice and sometimes even two for this sort of cricketer to realize that he would never play for St. Stephen's in an intercollegiate match. The top or first class cricketers of St. Stephen's consisted of those for whom playing for college was the stepping stone for greater things. They were fiercely loyal and passionately committed to intercollege cricket, yet their talent and self belief led them to think that they would, in their second year perhaps, be picked for the Delhi University side and in their third year or in their masters play for Delhi in the Ranji Trophy. I suppose some of them even dared to hope to play for India one day, which of course is what <clears throat> Arun Lal and Kirti Azad eventually did. I myself belonged in the second or intermediate class of those who would, with some luck, make the college first 11, but even with all the luck, would never make it anywhere beyond. After my first week in the Nets, I knew that if the breaks went my way, I would play for St. Stephen's. At the same time, I knew absolutely that I would never be good enough to play in the Ranji Trophy. <laughs> if there was a fourth division, I would have struggled to make it to that one. But I played a bit of <coughs> cricket myself without, um, uh, without um, covering myself in glory. I, uh, I'm, unlike you, no expert on the game at all. But like you, I don't remember when I played my first game of cricket, when I first held a bat or a ball in my hand. I don't even remember the first game I ever saw. But I dare say those must have been very heady experiences to, to, to create this, uh, this lifelong addiction to the game. I was moderately gifted. I could send in a fast one or two. I could swing my bat around. I could keep wicket. I loved fielding. But I, I never have quite understood the technicalities of the game. I was never coached. Uh, I was a poor student, so they didn't think me good enough to coach me in anything, including dramatics. Um, so even though I am uncertain where extra cover is, I can still... The aesthetics of the game still are very much uh, alive for me. I can, I, I can appreciate a, a fluent stroke or, uh, or a beautiful delivery or an acrobatic catch. But though I can remember the names of actors who played supporting tiny roles in films I saw when I was 10 years old, I don't have the kind of memory, obviously, that you have. My passion for the game is, your passion for the game is unmatched. But what I was wondering, while reading your descriptions of the, uh, the games that you played in school and college, I was astounded by, by how much you could retain not only the results of the matches, uh, but individual scores, descriptions of strokes, even the players' nicknames, uh, which, as I said, is something I could recall about a whole lot of uh, movies I saw when I was a child. Now, did you, uh, have you just absorbed all these things or did you, did you, have you kept an inventory of all these scores ever since you were a child? Not really, Nasir, but I should, you know, um... Uh, for the viewer and hopefully for the potential reader, say a little bit about how I became a cricket man. And it's to do with my uncle, Dore, who's really in some ways the hero of my book. Yes. My mother's brother, who was an outstanding club and university cricketer with a deformed right hand. With one hand, he bowled left arm spin and played almost to Ranji level. And as you know, Nasir, uh, in India, and in my view, probably more in South India, the mama is particularly dear to the nephew. You know, yeah, he's always a hero. He's a hero. That's so in North India as well. In North India as well. Yeah. And my uncle would have played for India if he'd had two hands and two legs. Uh, he came to the... So you mean in his bowling... Sorry to interrupt you, but then yeah. in his bowling action, he didn't use the other arm at all? He used it a little bit. Enough, enough to give him the propulsion. And yeah. so his, his right hand was on the bat. But, you know, if, for example, uh, he played with Arapali Prasanna, G.R. Vishwanath, they all know him, admire him for what he did. To captain a first first uh, first division club in Bangalore. Rahul Dravid has spoken of him as a coach. But anyway, so he I, when I, he came to visit us in Dehradun when I was six, and he claims I was playing with the father, my father in the lawn, and I bowled my father a leg break and beat him on the outside edge. The next ball was a googly. My father went to drive, and I bowled him through the gate. He said, apne bhanja ko test banaunga. He has two hands, <laughs> two legs, and he poured all his emotion, ambition. Desire suppressed uh, his own suppressed uh, failure onto me. He had no children, uh, so I became the object of that. Then I went. He played cricket for St. Stephen's, along with K. S. Indrajit Singh Ji and other outstanding players. So uh, that was my ambition to play for St. Stephen's. And I must say, I I don't think I mentioned this in the book, which is rather cheap of me. But among the reason, among my motives for playing in St. Stephen's was 
my uncle told me that as long as you go every day for practice i'll give you give you 50 rupees pocket money to add to your father's 100 rupees go that no i had to be the party that i was crazy about the game anyway and i think so and i think that's really got into me and action stevens as i also described in the book these three these three classes i was the intermediate class but ahead of me were arun lal and kirti azad who played for india across the road in hindu college was the magnificent swing bowler sudhir walson who was in the 1983 world cup team so you got to know high quality you know it's like i mean i don't i'm not saying this to flatter you nasir but if there is a ordinary actor on the set with you or with any other great actor you know shall, shall we say with meena kumari or you know, whatever you know uh, meryl streep an yeah. ordinary actor knows this is what separates me from greatness now the difference between cricket and acting is that the ordinary actor who is not meryl streep or tom hanks goes away with bitterness and kundak as they would say hindi kundak you know, that guy had all the luck mujhe but a, a ordinary cricketer goes away with joy and wonder ye kamal ki baat hai jo gavaskar le kya kamal ki baat hai and if you are lucky to write about it the wonder and glory and genuine authentic praise is reflected in what you write so it's by one of my many theories is that failed cricketers are not as emb- embittered as failed politicians <laughs> failed actors mm-hmm. failed art critics you know they they don't take it out on those who have succeeded rather they revel and praise it which is uh, and, and praise it revel in it and praise it and try to explain to those below below me so you know in a sense what i try to do by explaining uh, gavaskar straight drive or uh, mission bedi's art i was in the second class of cricketers uh, those there were people above me in the first class i try to as a second class cricketer i'm trying to tell the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh class cricketer what the first class cricketer does right now just what's last thing on the on the ranji trophy you know what are the people who makes a cameo appearance in this book uh is our mutual friend the late tom alter right and tom was an american batty about cricket as you know you played cricket with him and of course you acted with him and my last meeting with him shortly before he died was full of regret that the state of uttarakhand had not been created when we were still playing cricket because they would have had such a lousy team that both tom and me would have become ranji trophy cricketers so we, i may actually have become a first class cricketer <laughs> uttarakhand had been created in 1990 but not delhi or bombay or karnataka for sure well, you would have been one of the greatest uh, scorekeepers uh, that's for sure but, but 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 to carry on with your point about being confronted with the um a, a weak actor i uh, i try to make it a point not to pass judgment but the fact is that when you are um, confronted with someone superior it does elevate you i've had the privilege of uh, of playing uh, a few games of tennis with leander pace and mahesh bhupathi i've had the privilege of uh, bowling to sunil gavaskar of batting to his bowling on the nets in a movie that he acted in which i was also in uh, and I I don't say that I I suddenly discovered my hidden potential or anything of the sort but having a person like that across the net or having a person like that at the wicket it certainly sends a rush of adrenaline and it's it's like it, it's like when your life is in danger the life force asserts itself so I really did find myself performing better than I uh, than I otherwise otherwise would have no but you still didn't answer how do you manage to keep all these details in your head it's all in my head uh, except for the chapter in the bcci which is based on a diary i kept i grew right. up with memories and you know the thing about cricket uh, is that it's it's collective you talk you exchange stories many of the stories are not mine they are my uncles they are my friends hmm. and the memories of watching i mean it's i'm sure that uh, people like Ajay Gandhi who would have watched you in the play or would have watched other actors in the play would remember things and so it's just it's all in my head and the aesthetics I mean even uh, a match played forty five years ago which I described in the book which was Hindu versus Saint Stephen's it was my first year so I was not in the playing eleven I only made the playing eleven my second year I was a reserve Hari Gidwani who played for North Zone and East Zone but sadly not for India. scored 180 in a losing cause and i say it was the best innings in a losing cause i've ever seen and there's a hook shot of his and a on drive of his i can still remember you know and that's because I, again it's to do 
with an appreciation not just of scores not just of achievements not just of results and wins and losses and ties but a particular techniques you know a line spoken in a certain way a song in which this stress is on you know the second line of the song you know you know as classical music lovers will say about amir khan wo bihag mein to taan waisa taal aisa tha right i'm not saying by any means cricket is as as subtle or sophisticated as classical music i'm not saying that but my boy i'm not i'll not go that far in my love of obsession of cricket but still you know that oh you know uh, again a leg break that bhs chandrasekhar bowled to get arulal out in his first ranji match all of us had gone from st stevens all his teammates had gone a captain was playing his first ranji match and bhs chandrasekhar bowled him second ball ball dipped spun took the off bail and there was poor piggy bowled for zero in, <laughs> in his first ranji trophy innings so you know you can all that is so it's visually imprinted in your mind because it is so gorgeous it is so beautiful it is so compe- compelling it's it's the work of a genius it's a, like a tan of amir khan or kishori amonkar it's a work of a genius so it remains in your mind right i was never able to 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 read in these things i think because in my formative years uh, there was a constant uh, battle between cricket and uh, acting for you know for my attentions and and i and i was certainly um, inclined more towards acting i think it because it was, it was easier and also because i i didn't know whether i had the talent to be a cricketer i did of course dream uh, have have the dreams of one day i'll be playing for the country and so on but i did not dwell much on those dreams fast bowling was my uh, was the thing i was really interested in <laughs> i like to but not... that, must, that must be the afghan in you <laughs> yeah <laughs> i guess so uh, <laughs> but um, um this is a question which has been on uh, also on my mind about fast bowling you I, your admiration for spin bowlers is very evident uh, in the book uh, but what about fast bowlers ram yeah yeah why why such a long gap between mohammed nasar and kapil dev yeah 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 Uh, we had ramakant desai and abid ali uh, people like that but i mean we actually had to begin a test match with bishan singh bodhi bedi opening the bowling and and now of course we have the excellent jaspreet bumrah but what do you think is the reason why does why does the neighboring country keep producing fearsome fast bowler after fast bowler um, and even afghanistan can manage why aren't we it's nothing to do with the vegetarian diet and all you know So, so, what is your reading of this? So I'll answer that, but before, let me come to the remark you made about growing up. You know, since we are speaking uh, to, uh, to a group based in Hyderabad, there's a lovely book on Mansoor Ali Khan Pataudi, edited by Suresh Menon. Pataudi was a not a native Hyderabadi, but a domiciled one and played for Hyderabad in the Ranji Trophy. So, please claim him as one of your own. It's a beautiful book of essays, many wonderful essays, including by. Tony Lewis, Mike Brelly, and one man Nasir, where he talks about uh, never having met Pataudi and wanted yeah. to meet him and maybe bowl to him. Right. So, luckily for you, in retrospect, there were two passions: acting and uh, and 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 and. and I mean, in your in your own lovely memoir, uh, you talk about Nadi Tal and the Jesuit priest. I believe he was who introduced you to films. Yeah. And Tracy and so on. Right. Now, for me, it was only cricket. which made a huge gap in my life for example when i look at my children who are now in their 20s and one is that they are so soaked in high quality fiction and poetry mm. i missed it all because mm. you know i music i would listen to for various reasons so a single minded obsession also leads to a a distorted education think of education in a broader sense but b fortunately 40 years later when you write want to write your memoir about that obsession and where you failed it's all there because all i lived for was cricket between the ages of 11 and 21 all i lived for was playing watching reading discussing debating having dreams about cricket that's it right now to go back to your question about fast bowling there's a long gap between uh, uh, nisar and amar singh of the 1930s and uh, kapil dev and kapil dev himself famously says that when he first went for a camp i think it may have been a all india school boys camp the coach he said i want to be a fast bowler sir and the coach who was a i think even a former india test captain said india does not produce fast bowlers and he was determined to prove that person wrong mm. which he did now maybe 
Our wickets were slow. It's hard in Indian conditions, particularly the 50s and 60s when you did not have really high quality facilities to produce green tops. You could produce dust bowls on which Gupte and Makar and Pasanna and Bedi won your test matches, but you couldn't produce uh, good, good seam bowling wickets, which is why when we went abroad, we were humiliated. I mean, uh, one of the most, uh, for me, probably the most uh, miserable, depressing experience as a cricket fan were, were, was when we were 42 all out. 42 all out, yeah. I mean, I was only 16. I mean, you were older, so you probably took it slightly better on the chin than I did. I was a, I was a young boy, a school boy, and I was devastated by that. Right, And uh, so it took Kapil Dev, and Kapil Dev inspired many people. There would have been no Srinath, and so these are, you could, you could, in a sense, you can see Kapil Dev inaugurating a gharana step by step. Mm. So Kapil Dev gave rise to Srinath and Venkatesh Prasad, uh, who gave rise to Zahir, who inspired Zahir Khan, because their careers that overlapped a little bit. And then, of course, you had this wonderful efflorescence with Shami, Bhumra, uh, Ishan, uh, Bhumanesh Kumar, and others. And also because I think we realized that to win test matches abroad, our batsmen had to be good at playing fast bowling. And uh, which meant not just encouraging fast bowling in our coaching camps, but also having green wickets in the Ranji Trophy. So, you know, suddenly you'd have Ranji Trophy matches in which some fast bowler would get take seven for 11 because of the mm. wicket. And then mm. encourage people to bowl fast. And I'm glad. I mean, I am still a partisan of spin bowling. I think, you know, uh, there's a kind of, again, to go back to the aesthetics. All of us, not me, because I don't watch I IPL, but many viewers have been watching A.B. De Villiers hit sixes in the IPL. But he, A.B. De Villiers going doom, down, doom, down uh, in a 2020 match is very different and far less satisfying to the purist than watching A.B. De Villiers against uh, Ravi Ashwin on a turning track with a slip, a silly point and two short legs. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, with fast bowling, you know, Boom Boomra bowling, a Yorker in the 20th over of a T20 match is okay. He's obviously very skilled. But to see him with a new ball against uh, David Warner or Steve Smith, as we will uh, shortly, very again. Soon. So, in a sense, whether it's pass bowling, spin bowling, batsmanship, fielding, test cricket always brings out the most refined and most pleasurable aspects of the game, which is why I'm a partisan of bowlers and a partisan of test cricket. And I think so are you. Yes. How, how, how do you think it, someone like Sunil Gavaskar handled the fearsome bowling on his first tour of the West Indies if we were unused to, uh, uh, to practicing against fast bowlers? So he was, he, yeah. was it just his, his, his genius or, or do you think he did anything special to prepare for that? He was a young man then. So he was a very young man. It was his first tour and he continued to have an outstanding record against fast bowling. I mean, he's got 1300s against the West Indies, not just the two he made, two or three he made on his first tour, he had immaculate balance. You know, again, if you look, look at his stance, he had perfect balance. Mm. He didn't have a predetermined forward stroke like Kohli does. He had no helmet to protect him. Yeah. And yet, it's astonishing, he never remotely looked like getting hit. He always knew how to sway out of the way, inside, outside, play the hook shot, play the, you know, slash over, over cover. His balance was immaculate. I mean, his footwork and his balance and his stance, you know, maybe Vasu Paranjepe, one of his early coaches in Mumbai, had something to do with that. But his judge, I mean, in the Tendulkar and Kohli and uh, Rahane and Steve Smith and Joe Root all have the helmet and still they hit often on the head because, mm. you know, it protects them. Mm. Gavaskar never remotely looked like getting hit. And that was, in mm. some ways, the greatest as aspect of his batsmanship. The balance was what was really perfect, you know. Uh, I think that's it. It was really where he was. And he stood still right to the last minute. Knew when to move here, there, but he was just superb against fast bowling. He was right. also uh, of spin bowling, which people forget. In fact, I I, uh, I I had the good fortune to spend a bit of time with him while we were shooting this movie, and they weren't. Uh, I mean, there's there's few things you can say to to Sunil Gavaskar apart from you're great, and he already knows that, and it seems stupid to say a thing like that to him. But uh, I did ask him about uh, how how do you how do you respond to someone like Wesley Hall or, or Malcolm Marshall coming at you full tilt? How do you plan uh, for a, a, th a, th a thing like that? And he says, plan? You don't plan. <laughs> You've got one hundredth of a second <laughs> to respond. 
And you, it's, that's when your reflexes come into play. That made complete sense to me. And then another thing he said, which was very telling, he says, you know, on a good day, when the ball passes my nose, I can see the stitching on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really something. So I guess he was he was like uh, but Jonathan. Then, he, he never hit his nose. Never never looked like. Never hit. Yeah, <laughs> never did hit his nose. But he could he could hear it uh, going past him. Yeah. So I was saying he was like he was like Jonathan Livingstone Seagull or something. But then <clears throat> now spinners, I, I have never quite understood. Uh, I have to admit the difference between a. A, a hard top wicket and a, a, a dusty bowl, whatever they call it. Now, how, how does a person like Shane Warne get purchase on any kind of wicket? Why do our spinners struggle when they are faced with a green? With a, I know that the, the, the grass makes the ball bounce a little, but that's about all I know. Uh, surely, the quality of bowling uh, cannot be so much affected by the surface you are playing on. Well, no, I think Shane Warne was a once in a uh, lifetime genius. You know, I think um, uh, in terms of his and his zip, you know, his shoulder, his arm, the strength of his, uh, you know, wrist and uh, and the action, he could turn it on any wicket. And most leg spinners can turn it one or two inches, but he could turn it on a first day wicket and a lovely curving flight too. He didn't have a googly, which is why Indians always played him better. But he was a freak in that sense that he could mm. turn it even on a on a glass top. Yeah. But most figure spinners come into play on dusty wickets because the bounce is uneven. There's a crack. Uh, the turn is uneven. Finger spinners it means people like oh, Vision Singh Bedi. Particularly off spinners and also left arm spinners. Yeah. Old days when we were growing up, uh, the wickets were uncovered. So they'd be a sticky wicket. It'd rain at night. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'd kind of uh, go in the morning, the ball would unexpectedly bounce and turn. And uh, as an off spinner myself, I often prayed for rain the previous night. You know, um, there's a, again. Uh, uh, Why? Because then the next day the ball, the wicket would turn. Right. Now, there's an incident in my, one of the few great notable successes I had as a cricketer was in an inter-college tournament where in a practice match, Raman Lamma, who played for PGDAB, opening batsman, later played for India, scored 127 before lunch. And at least 90 of those runs were off me. All right, at least 90. <laughs> right. Then when it came to the tournament, the inter college quarter final, it rained the previous night. We put them in, and uh, the first over I bowled, the bloody ball jumped so much that it got his glove and he was out. Otherwise, he was, he was, he got a got a hundred for lunch on that day. But we don't have, um, uh, of course, uncovered pitches anymore, so we have to depend on natural wear and tear. Shit, I mean, shit, what? What is? I mean, it is that you know, like. Uh, it's, I, I try to think, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. you know, there must be some, like Bradman's duck on his last test innings. Shane Wall's inexplicable failure to succeed in India. In India. In everywhere else, you know. Uh, I think it's, 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 again, testimony to human life that not even the most supremely successful person always, uh, you know, uh, He's shine not, anywhere. Actors that have flops. You've had flops. I've had books that are flops. Mm. And Shane, Shane Warne, the greatest spin bowler of all time, uh, yes, was a disaster. You know, yeah. that's, that's something I think future biographers of Shane Warne will have to explain. What was it? When we went there, he got us out. I mean, I think there were matches he won in Australia against India in Australia, but not here. There are several spinners who won matches uh, uh, for India too, apart from the, the, the great quartet. Uh, of uh, uh, Bedi, Prasanna, Chandra, and Venkat. But there was, I, I can recall distinctly um, uh, uh, the, the 1960 Pakistan India series, uh, uh, a team led by Fazal Mahmood. Uh, and the, the whole series was a bore because every single match was drawn, if I recall right. Right, I think it was it was planned to do as nobody would feel offended. Even the even the inter varsities match was drawn. Even when they played counties, the matches were drawn. And Hanif Mohammad would just go on and on and on and on batting forever, despite his broken toenails. Yeah. But in the fifth uh, match at Delhi, which was at Kotla, I remember we were in school and I was we were on our way to 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 go to Nainital the day of the final day of the match. And we passed by Kotla Stadium and I begged my father, please let me go and watch this because we are going to win this match. Uh, there was this bowler called V. V. Kumar yeah, 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 who, yeah. who nearly bowled us to victory uh, in that match. Yeah. I never heard of V. V. Kumar again yeah. after that. 
Yeah. There was Jasu Patel who, uh, who, 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 who in Kanpur demolished right. the Australian side by, yeah. by gaining nine wickets in one innings and so on. Can you enlighten us what happened to both yeah. these players? Yeah. Just to name only two, there were yeah. there was also a, a, a fast bowler called Vivek Razdan who did extremely well for us in Pakistan and was never selected again. Yeah. I think uh, uh, they're all interesting uh, uh, stories. Uh, Jasu Patel uh, was brought back from retirement. I mean, he played his last test match six or seven years ago. And Lala Amarnath, who was chairman of selectors, knew the Australian weakness against offspin because they had failed against Laker the pre couple of years earlier in, in England. And Kanpur was the, at that stage the only test match wicket, which was matting wicket, not turf, where mm. offspinners get more turn and bounce. So he brought it back. Jasu Patel also had a totally dodgy action. By today's rules, he would not be bowling. He was what we call in Hindi, a vatta bowler. You know, I don't know what it is. bowler, vatta bata, you know, vatta. He throws a stone, right? Yeah. So he, he, he got it like that. And before the ICC could film his action, Lala Manna removed him from the team. <laughs> he, he, had, he had got us, Jasu Patel had got us our first, and, and that's his only victory against Australia. Right, so that's Jasu Patel's story. Vivi Kumar, uh, I think, um, uh, was a beautiful leg spinner, classical leg break, googly in the orthodox style from Tamil Nadu. You know, like like sort of like uh, Subhash Gupte. So he was, but he was kept out by Subhash Gupte. Got this chance, got seven wickets in the match. Mm. Played one more match, and then the freak Chandrasekhar arrived from my home state of Karnataka, and that was the end oh. of it. And he got I think four hundred wickets in the Ranji Trophy. And I once saw him in a match for Tamil Nadu against Railways, uh, when he was almost forty. He was a supremely gifted bowler. And he trained many spin bowlers afterwards. But Chandrasekhar put paid to him. Jasu Patel was meant to be a one-match wonder. <laughs> and Lala knew that. Right? Vivek Razdan, I don't know what happened. I suspect Vivek Razdan uh, was in the pre-fitness days and he must have liked his uh, butter chicken in Pandara Park and all of that. And he must have not just not taken care of his fitness. And mm. that was the end of him. But, you know, one thing about Halif, since you mentioned Halif, and since we've talked a little bit about Sunil Gavaskar, Sunil Gavaskar tells a lovely story about being coached by Vasu Paranjipe, whom we've, you know, we've, we've discussed. He's, he's, he says that Vasu Paranjipe told Sunil when he was a boy how to play the forward defensive. And then he didn't get it right. He said, you know, when Halif Muhammad played forward defensive at the Brabant Stadium, you could hear the tuk tuk in Churchgate Railway Station. That's all. <laughs> 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 the forward defensive. Yeah. You know, Hali, I mean, again, one last thing about Hari. You know, um, huh. he figures in this book because I saw him uh, in the Chinnaswamy Stadium. Uh, he was in the same row as me. You know, I was on one end, he was the other end, and he had dyed henna hair. Little fellow, and he was eating peanuts out of a bag, right? And someone mm. said, Hanif Mohammed, I said, that is Hanif Mohammed, right? The great unbowlable. But he was, I mean, he was, as, and again, Gavaskar. When we toured uh, Pakistan in 1978, our first tour in 17 years, Gavaskar, remembering what Vasu Paranjepe had told him, went straight from the Karachi airport to Harib Mohammed's house to pay tribute. To pay his That's respects. Yeah, yeah. Wow. One of the, uh, since we are also talking about spinners, why don't you talk a little about Balu Pavlankar? Because the chapter in your book, uh, spin and other terms about him was absolutely fascinating. Also, pretty heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. maybe you could you could tell us a little more about Balu. So, so Apparently, I mean, Balu's brother was a was a, was a brilliant bat. That's it. That's it. So Balu and his brother Vithal were heroes of uh, one of my earlier books, Call of a Foreign Field. And he was he was a Dalit uh, from Dharwad uh, who was a left arm spinner. In those days, again, young people reared on the IPL may not be completely aware of this. The premier domestic tournament in India was not even the Ranji Trophy. It was the Bombay Lions between the Europeans, the Hindus, the Muslims, and Muslims, the Muslims, Christians, Parsis. And after the Christians came later uh, yeah. after Balu had retired in 1935. And Balu was the preeminent Indian uh, Hindu spinner. Uh, when we toured England in 1911, the first All India team. Uh, captain by Maharaja Patiala, he got 150 wickets at the age of 36 and got some county contracts. When he came back, I will be the most successful player on the tour. B. R. Ambedkar, who was then a rising student leader, gave a speech of welcome and appreciation on behalf of the Dalits of Mumbai for Balu. That was Balu, right? However, he was never made captain because that was upturning the caste hierarchy. 
The captain had to be an upper caste Brahmin. Uh, so he was never made captain. By the time his younger brother Vithal came, Gandhi had returned from South Africa. Gandhi had made the abolition of untouchability central to the achievement of Swaraj. And Vithal fortunately was a batsman. And there's always a bias in favor of batsmen being captain, which is why mm -hmm. he was captain so late in his old career. And Vithal yeah. scored 100 uh, against the Europeans, against the white masters to win the tournament. And he was carried off the field by upper caste fans saying Mahatma Gandhi ki jai, Palwalkar Vithal ki jai. Bahat. So cricket played a role in social emancipation, which was the subject of that book. The forgotten role that cricket and the achievements, the staggering achievements and struggles of Balu and Vithal played in a sort of undermining caste prejudices among upper caste Brahmins and Banias and Kshatriyas in Mumbai. So, look, cricket can be emancipatory too. I mean, it's not right. just Sometimes it can play. I mean, the West Indies, uh, the phenomenal role it played in the anti-colonial movement. Mm. Or uh, in, in America, with uh, Jackie Robinson and the undermining of racial prejudice in baseball. So, but in this book, I wanted this to be a book not written by a historian, but by a fan. So, Balu right. hardly... I mean, this, this, right. Right. Yeah. You've written enough as a historian. It was it was very refreshing to read uh, about you as a fan, and also. And if I may uh, just uh, if I may just tell a, a story about our first meeting to our uh, to our viewers, Nasir and I first met. It must have been in about two thousand nine or ten. He may not remember, but I'm a historian. I remember everything. I remember it. He had, he had <laughs> come to my hometown, Bangalore, for a. Uh, Meeting in celebration of the work of Satyadev Dube, I think. Yeah. Uh, and there was a performance of the play. And there was a conversation after that with you on stage, and so was Girish Karnad, and you were talking about the debt you owed, and some others were also there. The debt you all owed to Satyadev Dube. And I was sitting in about the 14th row, and Nasir caught my eye. And he pointed to me and said, You come here, come here. I said, Why is this great actor calling me? I know nothing about film, I know nothing. I have just come because I have come to see these stars. And he called me up. I said, you come here. So I walked up obediently, went to stay. And he said, you've written that fat book on Indian history. You're the guy. I said, yes. He said, Wo padha hai. Lekin ki kata hai. <laughs> you know, and that's how we became. <laughs> I hope my recollection is broadly accurate. But that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except for the fact that I said, come here, come here. I don't think I said that. <laughs> <laughs> we have to meet through Girish. And I told you that uh, I introduced myself by saying I'm also a friend of RP. <laughs> okay, okay. Because had, uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, um, the how how do the Pakistanis keep creating fast bowlers? Now again, don't say it's the it's their muscle power, the Punjabi Pathan virility and the meat they eat. It's not that. It's something else. So as I said, uh, uh, Nasir, Kapil inspired. Srinath and uh, uh, you know, uh, the others, the following of people. Prasad, the Imran Khan. Imran Khan inspired Wasim and Wakar and all of that. And of course, mm. so I think that's certainly very much part of it. And they played a lot more county cricket. So in because the Pakistanis played a lot more county cricket than us. I mean, we had in the 1970s, really only Bedi and uh, who played for Northamptonshire. Hmm. And maybe Venkat played a couple of seasons for Derbyshire. But hmm. all the top Pakistani cricketers played county cricket from the 70s and 80s, where they honed their skills, especially oh. spring bowling skills and also ball tampering skills, not to forget. Not to forget. Sarfraz <laughs> <laughs> Nawaz, the supreme artist at... The... <laughs> but so at that, they passed on. So the slower one, uh, a reverse swing, uh, or the cutters, they learned that on English wickets. And to, with English professionals, you know, playing with because the English were high quality seam bowlers. So to their brute pace, I mean, Wakar, Wasim, and Imran were all really quick. No Indian fast bowler has achieved, mm. but they were all extremely subtle and skilled mm. that we forget. It was not merely pace. Merely pace gets you nowhere. I mean, if you think of a later Pakistani fast bowler who was faster than uh, Wasim or Wakar, called Muhammad Sami. Mohammed yeah. Sami, but he just bowled straight, so Sebag hit him four, four, Marta, he kept on hitting him, right? With the ball, you know how Sebag would have had a problem. So they were also greatly skilled, and that came, I think, from the exposure to county cricket, uh, which taught them the tricks of. In England. Yeah. 
in county cricket. Sunil Gavaskar, Vishwanath, etc. never played county cricket in England. Gavaskar played one season, 1980 for Somerset. Vishwanath never played. Uh, Prasanna never played. Chandrasekhar never played. Engineer played, but he was a wicket keeper. So, Bedi right. engineer of that generation. Kapil Dev played one season very late in his career. But mm -hmm. from the 1970s onwards, all the top Pakistanis were playing county cricket. One of the I most Mustafa, uh, Faraz, Asif Masood, all of them. Asif Iqbal, yeah. They, because the Pakistani domestic cricket is not anything to write home about. The that's, 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 also, that's linked to this, Nasir. Because we had a good Ranji Trophy tournament, huh. players thought we get enough good practice at home. But they had a lousy first class tournament. So right. even to hone their skills to perfect their art, they had to go overseas. But indirectly, it was beneficial, uh, both in producing fast bowlers and in playing fast bowling. We had only two batsmen who could play fast bowling. Gavaskar up there and Vishwanath a little below. Right. So otherwise, they would be, you know, uh, as, I, as I wrote in, not in this book, but in an earlier book that, or maybe in this book, that, uh, you know, our wickets, uh, when he went overseas, we tumbled very quickly. You know, they went fat, 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 fat like that. But they, Asif Iqbal, Majid Khan, Zahir Abbas, Mushtaq Muhammad could all play fast bowling. Imran Khan could all play fast bowling as well. That's why they also did better overseas than us. They did generally better in England than us. They were competitive in West Indies, which we rarely were. They won test matches in Australia in the 80s, which we virtually never did. And that's partly because they played country. Do you think that the fear of fast bowling had something to do with the Nari contractor incident where he, where he escaped death from, from this Griffith bouncer when he was hit on the head and which apparently terrified the Indian team so much that they were willing to throw in the towel, it seems? Do you think this has had a, had a domino effect? Almost, possibly, almost, possibly. I would, almost certainly, I would think. Possibly. I mean, there's an apocryphal story about uh, a great uh, Bombay batsman whom I shall not name facing Freddie Truman on a seeming uh -huh. And uh, the umpire, square leg umpire says, you're, you're, you're treading on my toes. He had retreated so far from the leg stump. So, so there, there was some of that too. Some of them were really scared. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what makes Gavaskar's achievement so much more remarkable. Mm. Right. He was special. There's, there, there, there's no two ways about that. <clears throat> However, reading... Through the book, the last two chapters, I have to admit, were a bit depressing, Ram. Um, to, to read about your experiences in trying to, uh, trying to set, set things right, wasn't it a bit over-ambitious of you to hope? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like me trying to say that I, I'm going to set the Hindi film industry right. It's, <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. This has been going on too long. Right. Um, I think there's always been a slight problem about this. Why can't we, why don't we have ex-cricketers on the selection board? Is it because they have their favorites? Is it because they're not considered intelligent enough? Is it because well, their perception is in doubt? Uh, or what is it? Why, why does a selection committee consist of a bunch of officials instead of people who know the game? Well, our, technically our selectors are former test cricketers, but they're very rarely the best test cricketer, you know, uh, the most effective selection committees we've had were when Vishwanath and then later Vengsarkar were chairman. But the board officials are usually non-players. But the tragedy is, as current experience shows, even when the most outstanding former players join the board, they get sucked into the system. They play the same games. They practice the same conflicts of interest as Ganguly is doing now. And you're right. It was a naive and foolish and idealistic, overly idealistic thought in me that accepted when I got the call from the Amicris Curie and the case of the Supreme Court saying, will you agree? I consulted a couple of few people and they said, you know, you have to do it. It's your, it's your great love. You have to try and do it. One wise classmate of mine, uh, uh, a retired IS officer from uh, Himachal Pradesh wrote to me saying, don't join. It's a mugs game. But I disregarded him. And, uh, I mean, but it was an interesting experience. I mean, like failing at cricket is an interesting experience. Spectacularly failing in cleaning up the BCCI is also an interesting experience, and that's why I related it uh, in, in my book. Yeah, it was very interestingly told, but uh, but as I said, deeply depressing. Anyway, do you think seeing the state of the game today, seeing 
the kind of fees that IPL players command, seeing the kind of uh, financial clout that the Indian Cricket Board has, do you think someone like Bishan Paji would be feeling gratified or, or feeling he's opened a Pandora's box because he was one of the first to, uh, to fight for, uh, uh, for a just um, equitable uh, distribution of the finances among the players and actually managed to do something about it. But do you think he ever dreamt that he'd live to see a day wh where, where this gully cricket uh, being played in the most respected stadiums uh, before I answer that question, honoring the kind of finances yeah. that it is, and um, I, 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 if I ever meet him, I would like to ask your opinion. Before I answer that question, let me read just one paragraph from the book about Bishan Bedi and my experience in the BCCI. Hmm. I say, from my experience in the BCCI, I concluded, and here I'm reading from my book. There are four categories of cricketing superstars in India. Category number one, crooks who consort with and pimp for bigger non-cricket playing crooks. Category number two, those who are willing and keen to practice conflict of interest explicitly. Category number three, those who will try to be on the right side of the law, but say absolutely silent on those in categories one and two. Category number four, those who are themselves clean and also question those in category one and two. In category number four, there is only one Indian only one cricketing gate who remotely has any chance of qualifying for inclusion. This is Bishan Bedi. Yes. Oh, okay. I think you will agree with that, right? Absolutely, so, yeah. My person of great principle and courage and integrity. And he fought, you're right, he fought for uh, higher fees, partly because, I mean, there was a match. There was a match against New Zealand, I think, in, 19, in the late 1960s, where he and Prasanna bowled us to victory. In those days, cricketers were paid... 50 rupees for each day of a test match. Yes, I know the story. He, in fact, I've heard it from his own, from the horses about that. And, and they, they won the match in three days and their two days fees. Was <laughs> so he was someone, so I think uh, he must be, of course, happy that no cricketers died destitute. I mean, he would have known test cricketers of his generation, whom he okay. and people like Pataudi had to help chip in with kind of, you know, uh, subsidies, financial subsidies and so on, the more generous yeah. members of the community. Now, he would be happy that IPL players are paid well, Rangi players are paid well, though their checks don't arrive on time, which also I've talked about in my book. But he would be distressed by the capitulation of the cricketers uh, to the nepotism, corruption and intrigue. He, a man of great principle, fought against British imperial domination of cricket, Right. But would not have wanted Indian imperial domination of cricket. Ah. That's the kind of man he is, right? Yes. So, uh, but, you know, he is extra, I mean, he is someone uh, who remains through all of this, not only a true cricketing great, but a real character of uprightness and integrity, which is true, not just of what he says about cricket, but what he says about our public life today. I mean, he wrote a piece right. in Indian Express a few months ago about the way the country is going. And right. only he, no film star of that stature uh, today, practicing film star or businessman could have said it the way he did. The way he said uh, it. Even, of course, he has his faults. I say in the book, uh, he's certainly a worse committee man than me. You know, he's, he's <laughs> terribly blunt. But I'm glad to have been able to pay my tribute to Bishan in this book, both as a player, but also as a human being. But he as is a human being, yeah. She, he is, absolutely, yeah. I remember... He he wrote me a personal handwritten letter, which I still have, uh, inviting me to his benefit match. Uh, and I went there, of course, uh, and attended the match. There were there were there were greats. There, uh, there was the the Mohammed brothers. There was Imran Khan. There was um, uh, several English players uh, over there, uh, and so on. And um, I, I, when I walked into the stadium, I saw him um, on the field playing with his son Angad, who was very small then. And so I went up to him to greet him and he said, Hachalo, bat pakro. <laughs> <laughs> so I held this bat <laughs> and he proceeded to sort of, you know, just sort of toss this ball in my direction. I could not connect with a single delivery while the crowd went quite ballistic about it. It was great fun. <laughs> He's a great man. I, I, I still correspond with him and he sends me very warm wishes every now and then. So, uh, uh, but to, to, to wind up this thing, you know, it is... It is certainly gratifying that so many young cricketers um, 
don't have to struggle to make ends meet the day of you know a cricketer like buddhi kundar and sleeping at the uh, at the bombay central station and coming to the day hopefully those days are over forever and it is totally gratifying that so many cricketers get to make their mark and uh, uh, and earn uh, enough to keep their families their home fires burning but this complete as capitulation as you said not only by the cricketers but by the the administrators i mean the television uh, channels seem so greedy uh, that it's it's completely disgusting i mean you have you have cut away to a, a, a commercial in between deliveries sometimes you don't come back to the match until the bowler has almost completed his run up yeah and and before anything happens in fact watching the interaction of the players on the pitch between deliveries is something i've always have found very interesting and in the old days it was fascinating to watch that uh, to watch how javed miyadad and imran spoke to each other to see how bob willis and ian botham etc all these gr- these great cats yeah. and to me the only thrill in the ipl was to watch anil kumble bowl to sachin tendulkar yeah, yeah. Uh, you know uh, or to see shane won bowl to um, uh, a great australian batsman apart from that i felt felt absolutely no thrill at all there's there's no one you can root for yeah. uh, and, and and it's not the most aesthetically pleasing uh, cricket that happens right. so it's i guess it's 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 it is a a double edged sword um and i think we are we might be running out of time so before we finish ram there's another passage that i that i would like to read which moved me greatly Uh, and uh, i hope it has the same resonance with with, with all those who, who who listen to it it's about your meeting with a pakistani cricket fan in denmark of all places i uh, so okay can i read that <clears throat> i'd like to end this chapter this is a chapter called some favorite pakistanis I'd like to end this chapter by recalling an encounter with a Pakistani cricket fan. It happened of all places on the outskirts of the city of Copenhagen after the Davis Cup match between Sweden and Denmark that I've alluded to earlier in the book. Once the tennis had ended, I walked back to the suburban station to take a train back to town. I bought my ticket and ascended the steps to the platform. When I reached there, I saw a man of my complexion, somewhat older than myself, holding a cricket bat i silently went up to him and took the bat from his hand checked the grip and balance and played as i recall a cover drive in the air this is something which only two cricketers could do to each other <laughs> when you don't ask any questions you just take the bat and you get the feel of the handle it's beautiful as i handed the bat back to the stranger the train arrived at the platform and we both got in after the train began moving towards copenhagen we introduced ourselves He was Ali from Lahore, I was Ram from Bangalore. I was merely visiting Denmark where he had whereas he had lived here for 20 years, coming originally as a guest worker. <clears throat> Ali had worked in a textile factory for a decade, acquiring Danish citizenship, making himself eligible for social security, quit his job and devoted himself to his one and only passion, the game of cricket. Every weekend he played a pickup match with other former Pakistani guest workers in a ground that lay in this supporting suburb of the city during the week he watched cricket at home it was telecast from around the world let me tell you a little story about i was shooting this movie called the league of extraordinary gentlemen in prague and winter was setting in i happened to bump into this these two brothers from pakistan who ran a, a grocery shop and of course they recognized me invited me home etc the usual uh, lahori hospitality and then they said aap cricket khelo ge So I said, "It's not turned me." He said, "Ah, huh? okay, kill." So the next Sunday, I had a Sunday off. So I said, "Chalo, cricket khel de." And it was raining that day, but these two creatures turned up with bat and ball and everything, and said, "Chaliye." So I said, "Be barish or he said, 'Nee, nee, aap aao to hamare saath.'" By the time we got to this kind of uh, apology for a ground, uh, the rain had stopped, but they produced from their kit a little, uh, a kind of a thing uh, like a carpet. Which which had perforations in it. It reminded me of the time I played golf in Ladakh, where you had to carry around a little patch of green with you, because because the, the golf courses they call it the browns, not the greens. And they laid this thing near the wicket. It was made of rubber, and they said, "Chali, khelte." And we played a perfectly satisfactory game with the ball. Uh, these two Pakistani brothers. I mean, the the, the the passion for the game in Pakistan too is is quite extraordinary. 
It was Sunday evening and the compartment was empty. We had an hour to chat and it was mostly about cricket with some stuff about family thrown in. Ali had four sons, two worked part-time in the mills, two others lived like the father on social security. All were keen on cricket. The patriarch was the keenest of them all. As the train trundled its way towards the city, Ali told me about the rich collection of video cassettes he had acquired by mail order from England, Australia and the Gulf. He had, he said, watched Viv Richards' double century at the Oval in 76 and Asaduddin's century at Lord's in 1990 over and over again. But then tragedy struck. When he and his family had gone to Pakistan on holiday, their home was burgled. The thieves took away many things, including the videos, not just cricketing, the family had collected over the years. However, when Ali made an insurance claim, he was promptly and fully compensated. For as he told me in Hindustani, Yaki Sarkarahmari Jesi Nye, Puri Mandari Sekam Karti. But while the burglary had not left Ali out of pocket, it had nonetheless left him spiritually bereft. As he said in anguish, Azar or Viv Karte of Kahasila. I suppose. His wife felt the same sense of loss about the Bombay films of the 1950s and the Lahore dramas of the 1970s. She would never be able to watch again. This I found this very moving, Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and I just hope that I just hope that one can only one can hope. I guess there's no there's, there's no bother. It's totally true. I'm a historian, not a novelist or a script. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely true. Uh, so to the stranger. The only piece of, you can say, uh, speculative thinking is the line about his wife. I hope she watched mm -hmm. the film, films of the 1950s. He didn't tell me, but I hope she did. That's the only speculative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think your assumption is absolutely correct. Pakistanis love Indian movies. In fact, every time I've gone there, they say, Aap ki do film you know, this kind of stuff. They go into raptures over them. The way we talk about Hollywood, they talk about, about Bollywood. It's, it's really funny. <clears throat> okay, I think we're time for the questions now, Ram. Thank you, Nasheed. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, Nasheed. And uh, thank you, Nasheed, first, because uh, <laughs> cricket is a passion for all of us. But uh, the, I was hoping that uh, you would go on like a test match for the next five days because this conversation was delightful, uh, you know. And, uh, and uh, like all uh, us old purists, we want test matches to happen, not the IPLs. Yeah. And yeah. this conversation is a purely test match cricket. <laughs> and uh, frankly, between me and Ajay, we don't mind if you're having a conversation for another hour. <laughs> That was a delightful conversation. Thank you. For the sheer range of topics, I mean, uh, you did mention Vivi Kumar and Jasu Patel. I must say, I remember uh, Rajinder Goyal also. He's another tireless bowler who never got a chance. Who never got a chance, yeah. Never got a chance. And I really liked the way uh, Ram remembers those cricketing events. And for me, the finest cricketing event I remember when I was very young was Solkar's hook shot in Hyderabad in the India versus New Zealand match. Mm -hmm. Till that time, I had never seen a hook shot. And in his <laughs> debut match, he scored two hooks. And for me, it was just a revelation that someone could even do that. <laughs> so I, I can connect to what Ram did. Your, uh, your conversation with Delightful means your vivid cricket memories and your. Vikram, we lost you. We lost you. Lost your audio. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, now yeah. you're back. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I just want one question, Ram, before we go ahead. Can you name that uh, Bombay batsman who you refuse to name on the square leg empire? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Several people I have not named in this book. <coughs> a really great uh, uh, batsman who ran out Sachin Tendulkar in a match I watched in hmm. Bangalore. That would be unfair. You know, I think I, I only really remember the nice things. On Rajendra Goel, I'd say that one of the few things I was able to do in my stint in the BCCI was with Diana Edulji have Goel and Shivalkar get the CK and Naidu Lifetime Award, which was uh, restricted only to test players, and also get Shanta Rangaswamy afforded the same award, which is previously restricted only to male cricketers. But Rajendra Goel was a magnificent bowler. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I know there are many, many players who could have made it to the test team but never got it because of the spin quartet, I guess. That also the dominance of the spin quartet in those days were fun. But uh, I also like the way you describe Bailey. Bailey was really enjoyed on the test field when Prasanna took a wicket. Very rarely you can see that. When, uh, when another spinner takes a wicket, he just rushes to Prasanna and hugs him as if there's a plan which they were working out together. I mean, that is a delightful thing. I don't know whether the present test cricketers enjoy each other's competence or talent sure. so much. There are many, many questions. So uh, I will start with the first question uh, here. Uh, in the 90s, when India did not dominate the cricketing world, it was ple pleasing for them to see win or lose a few test matches. Today, the financial domination of India seems to be boring. What will you tell a fan like me on, on the domination of India in the, BC, in the world of cricket? You know, I have, uh, you know, uh, Nasir asked about how Bailey would feel about there's so much money in the game. And I have, uh, you know, I'm ambivalent about India's overwhelming dominance on the field. I mean, when I was growing up, we had virtually never won a test match. So 1971 is a set of sacred digits for me. I mean, if anyone wants to open my phone, they just have to type 1971, which is not my date of birth. It's not my wife's date of birth. It's not my child children's date of birth. It's the year in which we beat England and West Indies for the first time. Right. Now it happens all the time. So it's kind of boring. And in that sense, it'd be nice, uh, you know, if um, the IPL provides a kind of distraction for that. But, you know, the only chapter in the 1990s were a very difficult time not just for Indian cricket, but for Indian politics and society as well. You know, the caste and communal conflicts of that time and the anxieties of that time uh, are vivid in our minds. And one of the reasons the only, the only kind of, um, uh, the only uh, uh, cricketer to whom, single cricketer to whom there's one chapter devoted is Tendulkar, because of what he represented as a cricketer and what he did at a time when the country was divided and when we usually didn't even win test matches. Yeah, that's right. Ram, uh, I would like to take one issue with you uh, against that about that phenomenal book, and that is the t subtitle of the book. You call this the most subtle and sophisticated g game known to humankind. As a golfer, I would contest that. <laughs> 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 there is so much nuance, subtlety, and uh, sophistication in golf that I would compete with that. Sheer uh, nonsense, Ajay. I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thought? Is there a game you want to go? Cricket versus golf? Sorry? I want, uh, Nasir may want to say something about golf versus cricket. I've never got hooked on golf. I have two brothers who are golf maniacs. Um, they're the sort who tee off at 6 o'clock in the morning every day kind of thing. I've never quite got hooked on it. Uh, it frustrates me greatly. And uh, it sort of le leads me into a, a black hole of depression every time I try to play it. So I'd anyway, say the, the biggest, yeah. the biggest uh, black mark against golf is that soon-to-be ex-president Donald Trump loves it. <laughs> There's a question here which is that how do you think cricket will evolve in the next 30 years? Do you oh. see it going as a baseball route? I, uh, being followed and played only in India and the subcontinent and not anywhere else? That's a very good question. That's entirely possible that uh, even today uh, in Australia, you know, today, India, Australia is the biggest, in terms of competitiveness, the most important cricketing challenge in the world is not West Indies, Australia, as it used to be, or Australia, England, as it used to be, but India, Australia. Even in Australia, cricket is well below Australian rules football and kind of competes with other sports for preeminence. That might happen. What would be even more worrying is that it's all IPL and T20 and yeah. not test. That says my book is also an allergy to a world that's been lost. It's, it's quite likely that uh, it'll just become, I mean, because you know, you remember Jagmohan Dalmia, when he became president of the ICC, he said, A, I'll make it an Olympic sport, and B, I'll make it a Chinese sport. Now, the Chinese are not going to take the cricket 
even if we are not, even if you are not fighting on the Ladakh border, they're not going to take to cricket. Certainly, the Americans aren't. I mean, a lot of these, lot of these benefit matches in America we played in Toronto; those have gone nowhere. So it's really becoming more and more of a subcontinental sport, which is sad. Yeah, in fact, I'm afraid uh, that this influence of baseball is going to get stronger. I mean, uh, all the sliding that you see fielders do is, is a straight carry over from baseball. I wouldn't be surprised if if a rule is introduced where where both batsmen can be dismissed. Uh, in air, like in baseball, uh, and and various other things like that, and I I, I dread that eventuality. Ram, uh, uh, you had uh, you have not. I mean, one of my uh, audience members asking me, why have you not named a Hyderabadi cricketer, especially including Jaisima? Would you like to narrate something about uh, your okay. encounters with the Hyderabadi cricketers? No, so again, you know, uh, you see the the thing about. Uh, these um, our provincial rivalries are so intense that always someone will say you've not done enough. So there's a chapter called Handshakes with Heroes. It lists 11 cricketers whose hands I've uh, shook, uh, hands I shook, who are not from Karnataka. Right now, out of those 11, three were from Hyderabad, from one town. So please read it. I was not lucky enough. Jessima, but I shook hands with his two best friends, Abbas Ali Beg and M.A.K. Potaudi. And I also had a very moving and uh, uh, depressing meeting, which I described with Azharuddin, you know, another great Hyderabadi cricketer. So, uh, so, so, of course, and I wish, you know, I had been uh, uh, old enough uh, to watch Jessima play and to have a drink with him in the Maret Pali Club. I think that's where he used to have his drinks, right? So, of course, and he figures in one of my books, Wickets in the East, which I wrote many years ago. But for those who complain that I don't love Hyderabad enough, ele- out of the 11 cricketers, I specially single out heroes in a chapter called Handshakes with Heroes. Three were from Hyderabad. Uh, this question is to you, Dashi. As, 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 as v- VVS Lakshman says, one of the nicest things about VVS Lakshman is he does not say Hyderabad. He says Hyderabad. <laughs> Is very sweet because the lovely thing about Hyderabad is that there's so much diversity. You know, mm-hmm. for example, one of the people help, uh, of your team I see is a uh, Jehan Taraporwala. Right now, I wonder if he is related to my friend Darayas Taraporwala, who also has a Hyderabad connection. Hyderabad has, as you know, an old Parsi community. The best known Hyderabad coach was E.B. Aibara, mm-hmm. who coached Abbas Ali Beg. So, when V.S. Lakshman says, he is from Hyderabad. I know he's a true Hyderabadi. <laughs> no, this question is to uh, Nasir Bhai. Uh, do you think that uh, test cricket will end up like those genre of art films where everyone appreciate, uh, but then it will never pay and it won't get audiences? That's a depressing uh, question. But uh, the fact also is that uh, the occasional art film does hit the bullseye every now and then, uh, and does something unexpected. It will be, uh, it'll be a sad day, indeed, if Test Cricket, uh, uh, which I'm afraid in the next few years is going to get reduced to four days. Uh, and, and of course, there are going to be new rules and so on. But it'll be a sad day, indeed, if Test Cricket, if, if no one ever goes to see Test Cricket any longer. Uh, watching on TV, the only, the only countries where I see crowds uh, watching Test Cricket is England. And sometimes in India, but uh, in, in India, as, as Ram has described in his book, the crowds are very partisan. They would not even uh, think of applauding a great like Javed Miyadat playing his, walking out after his last innings. Uh, they would curse him instead. So it is entirely possible, though that would be a, a very depressing thing. And it would also be underestimating the taste of the Indian public, I think. There are lots of us who still enjoy uh, a test cricket and one can only hope and pray that it doesn't, doesn't die out or end up like IPL. So one of the redeeming features of um, which may gives us hope is that the players themselves love test cricket more. I mean, someone who's done very well in T20 and uh, 50-50 but does not have a good test record feels it and wants to remove that blot in his career. Right. Players long, know it's the most supreme form of the game. But how long do you think that 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 attitude will stay, Ram? Because you yeah. had MS Dhoni quit in the middle of a test series. Yeah, yeah that's true. Obviously, yeah. test playing doesn't mean anything to him. It meant nothing to him, yeah. yeah. 
frankly, with the kind of money they are making for test matches, they should say tickets are free mm. and allow people to come and see what, what's wrong. I mean, they are not going to live on the revenue of that uh, of the uh, ticket sale. Why don't they just make it free and allow more school students, college students, all of us to go and mm -hmm. sit there? There's another question here, Ram. This is to you. Uh, they want somebody wants you to have a word about the 1971 West Indies series. I think this is about the Gavaskar's debut series, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what. what I mean, so they want to. The first series was earlier than that. 71, 71, 70, 71, 71. Uh, you know, um, it's true that the West Indies was in a rebuilding period. You know, they had lost Hall and Griffith, uh, and they were not yet with Roberts and Marshall and so on. Viv Richards had not come along. Greenwich had not come along. In that sense, we struck them at a weak moment. Uh, but we had a new captain and uh, some outstanding Bombay batsmen. I think uh, Gavaskar, apart from Gavaskar, Sardesai played well. Uh, Durali took in one match, who was one of our most magical all rounders, uh, who often you know, uh, delivered when no one expected him to, caught Sobers and Lloyd out, the two best batsmen out in that crucial innings. Uh, you know, I was a school student then. I talk about having to read the match reports of K and Prabhu in the Times of India. You know, there was no live telecast. There may have been radio commentary, but I didn't hear it. Do you have memories of radio commentary of that series, Nasi? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All of us. Yeah, yeah. There was radio, there was radio commentary. But I, I didn't watch it. I was in school and boarding schools. So I didn't hear it. Yeah. yeah. Except that the commentaries were such, at such odd times that were in yeah. school, it wasn't possible to access them. Yeah, yeah. Being uh, played in England, you could you could uh, perhaps hear it, but Australia and all these uh, West Indies. Yeah. So one question is, who's your favorite cricketer and who's your favorite Indian cricketer? You know, I cannot have one favorite cricketer. Impossible, impossible. Uh, and uh, one of the arguments in this book is that every cricket fan grows up with two kinds of chauvinism. Those of nation and those of generation, right? And it's not surprising that the question is about favorite Indian cricketer. And normally you grow up with your heroes. I mean, for Nasir, it may have been Pataudi and Umbrigar. I'm slightly younger than him. For me, it was Vishwanath and Bedi and Gavaskar. But a true cricket fan transcends the chauvinism of nation and generation. You know, uh, I have no doubt now that in my all time Indian 11, GR Vishwanath has been replaced by Virat Kohli at batting at number five after Sevad, Gavaskar, Javed and Tendulkar. It's no longer Vishwanath, it's Virat Kohli. And also to appreciate cricketers from other countries. I mean, my epigraph to my book comes from Jack Singleton, the great Australian cricket writer who says, the older I get, the less I can, I'm concerned about who wins the match, the less nationalistic I become. It's the innings, the wickets, the art that matters to me. So right. I suppose, as a human being, Bishan Singh Bedi, uh, a cricketer uh, who's also a person of sterling character, I have known no one like Bishan Singh Bedi, but there are many great cricketers. I, I mean, Prasad, because I was an off spinner, in some ways as a bowler, I admire Prasanna more than Bedi because he did so much better what I couldn't do because you could, I could relate to what he was trying to do more. But I think it's the, this is a book that celebrates cricketers at all levels. You know, club, club cricketers from Dharadun like R.P. whom uh, uh, Nasir also knows, who once got a hundred against me, which I can still remember. Uh, state cricketers, uh, Pakistani cricketers, West Indian cricketers. This is a celebration of all forms of the game, which is why I've called it the Commonwealth of Cricket. It's a non-jingoistic book. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I really admire a person like Hashim Amla. Uh, I loved uh, watching Inzam Amul Haq bat. Bishan Paji, his bowling, of course, was magical, but I enjoyed watching him bat even more than, than, than watching him bowl. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> but um, I, I admire Hashim Amla for many reasons, for, uh, apart from his technical excellence, for the courage that the man showed. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah um, in, in not disguising who he was and not being ruffled by the negative reaction that must have come his way and to... Um, Though I don't approve of fundamentalism in any way, I, I dislike very much the Pakistani team doing namaz on the cricket field and so on, uh, and, and displaying their religiosity. 
But with Hashim Amla, he was a man who really carried himself with a great deal of dignity and, and about whom one never got to know much uh, uh, about, uh, apart from, from, the, from the cricket field. And, um, and that lovely leg glide, that lovely leg glide he played. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. But uh, I must also point you out to, uh, you can go to the YouTube and watch 10 hilarious runouts of Inzam Amal Park. Ah, Yes, <laughs> there's the great story about uh, uh, about Inzamam uh, uh, telling Vaseem and Vaseem was captain. That <laughs> every <laughs> time you see Well, by the way, by the way, uh, I mean, this is only uh, young people will know Inzamam, but there was a famous English batsman, Dennis Compton, who was notorious for running out his partner. <laughs> he played for Middlesex in England with Bill Edrich, who was an equally bad runner between the wickets. There was a match in which both pill, uh, pulled their uh, leg strain. In those days, you were allowed for runners. Each had a runner. And at one moment in the match, all four were the same end. <laughs> <laughs> so, I I must ask you a more serious question, Rama, on the uh, issue of match fixing. Yeah. I don't know whether you mentioned that in the book, because frankly, I, I didn't yeah. have read the book yet. But that is a serious issue, and it has plagued both India and the world of cricket. Yeah. And uh, now it has become part of jargon that when somebody gets out suddenly or gets a weekend, we say, ah, match fix ho gaya. So I want to know how serious is this issue, how real is this issue, and is it still pervasive? So it was serious, which is why you had to begin with. Uh, the uh, you know the Hansi Cronier incident. That's why you had the banning of Indian players. That's why you had the Murgal committee, the Loda committee. Uh, clearly, some IPL owners were complicit in spot fixing, if not match fixing. It's gone out of Test cricket. Uh, whether it's still there in the IPL, I can't say because I don't watch the IPL. But there, I, ca I can't really say. But it's not really there in Test cricket anymore. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. It's a good question, actually. Who has been your favorite commentators and broadcasters from across? Yeah, so I mentioned in my book, I, you know, Nasir read out a part of my uh, uh, my Pakistan chapter. Somewhere in the Pakistan chapter is a dream Indian 11 versus a dream Pakistani 11. And I say the ICC can nominate the um, neutral umpires, but I will nominate the commentators who are Michael Atherton and Shane Warne. So today, Michael Atherton and Shane Warne are far away from my favorite commentators. Michael Holding is a little behind them. You know, he slightly lost his peak. He may have been better five or seven years ago. Uh, wonderful writer, like Gideon Haig. I mean, talk about favorite cricketer I don't have. But in my view, the best cricket writer living or unborn is Gideon Haig of Australia. So his writings, each one of them, I admire. Probably he's written three of the best cricket books in the last 20 years. His short biography of Warren. His longer book on Victor Trumper. Uh, and a marvelous biography of the mystery spinner, Jack Iverson. So, when I was growing up, it was John Arlott. I did not like Brian Johnston because there was a racist tinge to Brian Johnston. You know, when a West Indian bowled a bouncer, he would say a nasty one. When an Englishman bowled a bouncer, he would say what a splendid ball, right? And he would make fun of names. I mean, you talk, well, Nasir talked about Hasi Mamla. Brian Johnston only called Miandad, Mom and I. Because me and dad, mum and I, as we said, very funny English joke. When Venkat came as captain of the 1979 team, he said, Venkat Shagwan, I'll call him rent a caravan. You know, that, that kind of extraordinary racial prejudice that was there, which John Arlott resisted. I mean, John Arlott was the first great English cricketing journalist to be totally opposed to apartheid. When he went to South Africa during apartheid, uh, accompanying the English team, and on the form, they had to say race. Race was white, African, Indian, colored. Against race, he said human. He said human, right. So, John Arlott of that generation, also for his writing, for his wonderful Hampshire burr. Nasir, can you try and imitate John Arlott speaking with a Hampshire accent? <laughs> it's rather difficult. I've tried. <laughs> boycott I can manage, but... <laughs> oh, boycott. Give us boycott. Give us boycott. Give us boycott. Rubbish. <laughs> My mom can bow better than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, what about radio commentators, Ram? The old radio commentators. I thought they were fantastic. V.M. Chakrapani, Devraj Puri. Um, 
uh, too young for them because Harish or Badalkari, they were they were fantastic. It was the late sixties, and I really started in the early seventies, so I kind of missed them. Chakramani had gone to Australia, Achha. and uh, he was known as Chak. He was they would say thank you, Chak. I remember Chakramani in the seventies, but by the time I came, I mean I wouldn't want to mention them. Some of them may still be alive, but huh. uh, the seventies and eighties, we had dreadful commentators. Yes. Harsha Bogle, my view is a better uh, Aitharabadi and Aitharabadi Harsha Bogle, who is uh -huh. a my view a better radio commentator than a television commentator. On well, radio. Harsha is interesting to listen to anyway, but some of our commentators are really, uh, I mean, you just wish they'd shut up. Uh, in fact, a lot of the time uh, I have to mute the sound because they 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 talk such they tell you what's what you're seeing on the screen and instead of analyzing what's happening on the screen. They're describing what is happening. It's like like a Hindi movie where everything is explained and underlined uh, in red. Um, I, in fact, when <clears throat> when television commentary first began, this friend of mine, Jalal, and I used to watch uh, the matches at his house on the black and white TV, and we used to keep the radio commentary on instead of the, the television commentary, because television commentators tend to faff a little too much. And, uh, uh, and uh, you should also mention Alan McGrillway in Australia. And Tony Cozia. Tony Cozia, magnificent on TV and on radio. Absolutely. Alan McGrillway missed the last four overs of the tight test match because he said nothing was going to happen. And then the match was spiked. So later in his last commentary, uh, which he gave, he did mention that after that, he never left the field till the last ball was bowled. <laughs> and it is the deepest regret that this is how test match is fashioned out and he was not there. Yeah, there is nothing to match the excitement on the end of a, uh, at the end of a five-day match. No IPL acrobatics can can come anywhere near uh, the kind of uh, anxiety and the kind of tension and enjoyment that that provides. Yeah. So Ram, uh, uh, I would go with uh, Nisiguddin Shah when he talked about uh, the last couple of chapters of your book. They are actually very depressing. And uh, uh, hats off to you for coming out so strongly, both during your stay at the COA and in this book. Uh, it really depresses us to see how the sport is being managed by, by the body. And uh, how do you think we could move ahead? Uh, how, what kind of future would the sport have with uh, something as laden with corruption, nepotism, and, uh, uh, and all the ills that you have described? What kind of a future would it have? You know, uh, Ajay, uh, because those two chapters I knew would be depressing to readers, they are, in fact, not the last two chapters. I, I know. The chapter about the love of cricket and my love of bowling and that's I, I agree. I so, agree. Uh, because I wanted to end on a somewhat uplifting note. You know, I tried, I failed, I've documented it for what people to look at and reflect upon. But I have moved on. I'm a, a fan again, you know. I am a fan again. I will watch my club FUCC play. I watch my state. I'll watch Test cricket in uh, Australia, England. Whoever is playing, I'll read about it. I wait for Gideon Hague's next book uh, uh, with eager anticipation. Uh, so I've kind of moved on. You know, I've realized that I it's best if I just remain a fan, detached from the ugliness of what's going on inside the world. I will ask the uh, last question. Because because because. because. Because there's a lot of ugliness, more important and more dangerous ugliness elsewhere in our society and polity. And let me reserve my anger and polemics for that. I just love to hear. No, uh, uh, first I want a confirmation from you. There is one tweet which is going around that you chose an India-Pakistan level. Yes. yes. Is it true? I mean, I, 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 yeah, it is true. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Because I didn't see that. I, mean, I didn't read the book. Because you know how much fake thing goes around, so I just want to confirm. I, I, it is a... So, I want to know names of two or three cricketers who are, you think you are sad to have been left out in that list. So, there are many. So, I mean, there were very, some very interesting comments on that 11. So, uh, I, I left out Seva because I had Gavaskar and Saeed Anwar opening. Okay, because one right hand, one left hand, one stroke player, you know. So, maybe, I mean, on reflection, probably Seva has a better case than uh, Saeed Anwar. But I was thinking of Saeed Anwar, A, his artistry, and B, left hand, right hand. I mean, that's always, for a bowler, it's very tough to, much tougher to bowl to left hand, right hand than to, uh, to uh, but that was the only one, probably. The only one, looking at all the comments on the tweet, you know, last deep I tweeted, I looked at all the comments, and I disregarded the 
crazy, nutty, abusive ones, uh, which I, of course, you know, I'm um, nothing to do with cricket at all. But from a cricketing point of view, possibly, but there were also some totally cricketing tweets, uh, responses, which are totally uninformed. For example, one said, Saklen Mushtaq instead of Vinu Mankad. <laughs> so it could only have been written by someone who's less than 30 years old, right? Okay. So, Seva, yeah, maybe, you know, I was going more, more as a strategist for left hand, right hand, but Seva was a truly fabulous player. And on cricketing record, probably he should have been ahead of the uh, side. But you know, this is, the joy of 11s is that they're for arguments. Ah, exactly. That's there for other fancy. Yeah. For example, I chose Kirmani as a wicketkeeper, but uh, Basim Bari probably has an equally good case. Uh, you know, so did Rashid Latif, who's also an outstanding batsman. So that's fine. This is part of. Uh, I, I think Kirmani is a better keeper because he could keep wickets to Chandrasekhar. Yeah, but Rasim Bari was also mar marvelous. I mean, a Pakistani will tell you how good he was. So that's that's fine. Mm -hmm. This is of the for the fun of our eleven is to spark a debate. So uh, I'll ask one question, the last one uh, to both of you. Um, the question reads: Even as you had passion for cricket and acting, both of you have strong political, uh, strong views on India's politics. How did that happen? So I think we'll have to come to Manthan. Uh, together <laughs> under that lovely bunion tree and chat <laughs> and talk about it. Yeah. Politics. I'm happy to do that. But uh, you know, uh, Nasir started by talking about one of the early films in which he got a break, Little Manthan. Yes. Now, uh, if memory serves, Sham Benegal has a Hyderabad connection. Correct. Yes. College. That's very Absolutely. appropriate. Nasir mentioned that. Yes. And I wonder if the name Manthan has to anything to do with the film. Uh. <laughs> Tragically not. <laughs> uh, in 2005, when Vikram and I were talking about what name to give to this uh, platform that we were starting, okay. we thought Manthan would be the appropriate word which would explain, you know, what we plan to do about it. And, uh, does, and he, that does, is, does, does he read Sham a cricket lover? Sham is informed about cricket. Uh -huh. I don't know if he's ever played. I, I think he was, a, he, his, his sport was swimming. Uh, That's what I've heard uh, when he was in college. But I, I don't think... And volleyball. We, he used to join us, uh, join in a game of volleyball now and then on the sets. Mm -hmm. Govind also, but then Govind got afraid he'd hurt his finger and he had to handle the camera. But I don't know if Sham ever played cricket, but he knows a lot about it. I mean, you can talk to Sham about any uh, subject. I can talk to Sham about anything. I mean, when the first time I met him, uh, he knew more about... A very relevant in tribals than I had, even though I spent 10 years. 10 years <laughs> He's an amazing man. I don't think Girish Karnad followed cricket also. Another mm, idea. I, I don't. I, I don't think so. He but uh, he, I mean, it's nice that Manthan, gave, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> let his break and of course, and Kham, sure. Hyderabad. You know, um, a Konkani from Hyderabad, adding to mm. your extraordinary diversity. So I'm sure Dasir and I will come again and talk about other things. Under Thank Hyderabad. you. Thank you so very much. We'll hold you to it, both Thank of you. you. I okay. mean, you are heroes that we have and we would love to have you back. Thank you so very much. This was a most delightful conversation that we had. Uh, the audience uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm sure uh, uh, this will be heard several times uh, once it's put up on YouTube. Thank you so very much, both of you. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have some very interesting events coming up. Next Sunday, we have Shiv Shankar Menon who will be coming and talking to us on uh, India and China. On 5th uh, December, we have Angela Saini from uh, uh, London who will be talking to us on race and gender. On 13th of December, we will have Mohit Satyanand who will talk to us on trust and the Indian nation. And then on 19th December, we will have Tarun Khanna from Harvard who will be talking to us. Uh, followed by several interesting uh, conversations that are lined up in January. Look forward to having all of you with us. And thank you to gentlemen once again, to both of you. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ram. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. See you soon.